Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the weekly chart of the Chinese Yuan. And if you remember a while back when the rally started in this, uh, in the dollar versus the Chinese currency, I predicted that it would be a short lived dead cat bounce type of situation. Now, we did have that devaluation story in the summer and the subsequent bombs going off in the Chinese ports, but Really, I think that's just a flash in the pan. I think that the trend is going to continue. The Chinese currency is going to continue to strengthen against the U.S. dollar. I think the fundamentals dictate that. Now, we're going to talk about Chinese bonds and um, the prospect for investing in them. That's going to be a, a play for risky money. But before we do that, I want to look at the cryptocurrencies. Now, we had a move in Litecoin that kind of followed on the heels of Bitcoin. Now the Litecoin is following, and it's not just Litecoin, it's actually other cryptocurrencies, um, Namecoin and all the others uh, are starting to follow Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's starting to turn down. So we're going to see if this bounce actually amounts to anything. You can see the huge volume coming in. This is uh, Litecoin in uh, the Chinese Yuan. The reason why I'm showing you this chart is because right now, as far as cryptocurrencies go, uh, Chinese activity is the only thing that matters. So you can see we actually do have the largest uh, green spike and green candlestick that we've had uh, in the entire time that this cryptocurrency has traded. You can see that this spike here um, back in June actually presaged a run up to about 55 uh, in the Chinese Yuan for, for the uh, Litecoin. Uh, we're down at about half that price, but if this volume is any indicator, then uh, we may get a follow-on rise and actually a new high. But I want to show you the volume of trading in the cryptocurrencies. You can see that now the volume in all cryptocurrencies is 93.44% denominated in Chinese Yuan whereas it's only 5.46% in US dollars and 0.79% in euros. Now, I point out last time that we were the first ones to point out that cryptocurrencies are a defeat of capital controls. They give you the ability to transfer any amount of wealth anywhere in the world. I showed you the blockchain and the amounts that are going through now, the Chinese have a, a very strong interest in being able to defeat capital control simply because the Chinese government is known for kind of offing billionaires or taking over their assets. So very wealthy people in China, and especially their children, uh, are interested in getting their money out of the country. Now, the problem is as far as cryptocurrencies go, that the market caps just aren't large enough. The market cap of Bitcoin itself is around four to five billion and Litecoin and the rest of them are just a tiny, tiny fraction. So that number has to rise tremendously. Now I wanna go back to the Bitcoin chart and pull up the Bitfinex chart here and we'll get to a long range view. Now, if you look at the pattern long term, well, it's not showing up here, but um, long-term pattern in, we'll have to go to Bitstamp. There we go. So you can see that basically the, the major run-up in Bitcoin happened in 2013 with that run-up to about 250. Now, that was then superseded by a run-up to about 1,200. So about a four or five fold move. Now, you can see that the volume coming in, and if we go to the Chinese currency, it, it's much, much larger. Um, this is mainly US volume. 
But if this pattern holds here and we get a type of four or five fold rise from the top, then we're talking actually about a $5,000 uh, Bitcoin price. Now, that's really not that unbelievable. It actually can happen. It's happened before more than once. So here it is in the Chinese currency. You can see that the move in to this latest rise here, which takes out that old high, is nothing like we've ever seen before. So it's my opinion that uh, Bitcoin needs to move about fivefold from the last high, which is going to give us about a $5,000 price on Bitcoin. Um, that's going to be 10 to 15 times higher than we are. And that's going to give us a 75 to $100 billion market cap on Bitcoin. But that makes sense to me. That's actually going to be a price where a, a decent amount of capital can, can move across borders. Because at the current market cap for Bitcoin, there's just no way that a serious amount of capital can cross borders. The, the market cap is just too low. Now I wanted to take you over to the Lunar Series here real quick. This is Atmex and of course I've been watching the Lunar Monkey and there are some thin volumes in the Lunar Monkey. It, it's looking like one of the better ones actually as far as volume for this type time of year and uh, the, the number of coins that we're seeing order. Remember that these coins are only minted to order. And if, if there isn't a demand, if they're not being bought, then they aren't being minted. That ends up with there being a much lower number, especially with the half ounce and the two ounce. You remember you have that 300,000 committed number for the one ounce. So we've got the half ounce monkey at 1220 we're watching that really closely but i wanted to point out to you uh some interesting stuff here first of all the goat is up around 26 bucks for that half ounce goat that's the one we were accumulating last and then we've got a sale on the 2012 half ounce dragon at the same price 2581 and then even more shocking is the horse and i told you when i saw that coin i really thought that was going to be a big performer just because the design of the coin is so fantastic and you can see here that atmex is trying to get i'm not saying that's the value but i'm just pointing out that they're trying to get with one coin in stock 20 they're trying to get 30 bucks a coin for the half ounce that that amounts to 60 dollar an ounce silver so Congratulations to all the members that have stacked a lot of those half-ounce lunar horses. I, I don't see how you can lose on that. Um, they're really moving. So let's get to this story about the Chinese bonds. Now, I want to show you the chart here again of the Chinese currency there's going to be a number of factors that you want to look at when you're talking about investing in bonds. You want to look at the interest rate, of course, that's the biggest issue is what type of interest is being paid on that bond. But the second thing you want to look at, which is very important, is of course this, the value of the currency. If you buy a bond that's denominated in a currency and that currency appreciates, even if the value of the bond does not appreciate, you're still gaining because the currency the bond is denominated in, you're going to be paid back in a currency that's worth more. Now, another factor is going to be the interest rate on the bond, but specifically the direction of the interest rate. So the way that this works, I've explained this before, is that if you hold a bond in a country's debt where the interest rate is falling, that means the existing bonds actually go up in value. So if you have, for example, a 
yielding bond in Chinese yuan, and the interest rate goes down to say 2%, then that means that the existing bonds that yield 3% are worth that much more. So these are the factors that you have. You have the existing interest rate. Now let's cover these real quick. The existing interest rate of 3%, that is higher than anything that we have in the Western world. That's a positive. Then you have the direction of the interest rates in that bond. Those are going down. That's a positive. That means the existing bonds are going to gain. You have a bull market in those bonds. Then you have the direction of the currency. That's a positive. Because in my opinion, the Chinese Yuan will continue to gain value. And the last thing that is kind of uh, not really certain, but in my opinion, is definitely going to be something going forward is the attempt by the Chinese uh, authorities to make the Yuan a world currency and a reliable currency. And what that means is that they have an interest in maintaining stability and keeping these interest rates stable and uh, keeping the value of their currency stable. That's the only way that they're going to have a chance to get world investors uh, start investing into their bonds. Now, let's look at a mainstream media article. This is the Wall Street Journal. It might as well be the New York Times, the New York Slimes. It's mainstream media, and this is what they're saying. Why investors shy away from China's $6.4 trillion bond market? As China throws open the doors to its vast bond markets, foreign investors aren't coming in just yet. In recent weeks, Beijing has made determined moves to give global money managers access to its previously closed off $6.4 trillion market, allowing foreign banks to tap its short-term lending markets for the first time in and doing away with some investment restrictions. While the moves mark a significant moment for China's financial market liberalization, the pickup has been slow. Foreign owners less than foreigners own less than three percent of Chinese bonds. That pace speaks to the challenges foreign investors face in entering the world's third largest bond market. Its fragmented structure with a web of regulators and policies remains difficult for global investors to navigate. Investors say China's bond market hasn't been through a full credit cycle or rotation from a period of low interest rates and easy borrowing to tight lending conditions when defaults can rise. That could mean pockets of turbulence and periods of heightened volatility lie ahead. Jasmine Wu, a portfolio investor at Fuhua Securities Investment Trust in Taiwan, said the trust has pulled back on its investment in China onshore bonds. She says most offshore bonds provide higher yield than onshore under the same issuer. Given falling interest rates in China, the result of the central bank's effort to ease lending conditions, the onshore bond market has limited liquidity. She added, the turnover ratio for China's government bonds, a measure of how much a bond trades in the secondary market, ranges between 0.3 and 1.9, according to data compiled by Fund Global Institute, compared with 10 for the U.S. Treasury market and 5.9 for the Japanese government bonds. So... This is all counterintuitive. Basically, the arguments that they're using is that these existing debtors, the U.S. and Japan, their debt is more reliable because it trades a higher volume. Now, I'm going to argue that there is a very good reason for those of you who have the funds that are definitely risk funds. Um, there's a very good reason to begin looking at the Chinese bonds. Like I said, there's four reasons. There is the currency, which in my opinion has to rise. There is the interest rate, which currently is higher than everything in the West, but there's also the interest rate going down, which means the value of those bonds is also going to rise. So you're talking about buying a bond that has a higher interest rate than anywhere else that's rising in value with a currency that's rising in value and with a country that has a incentive to stabilize their market to try to become a large player 
And of course, the last factor is you also have a country where they have trillions and trillions of dollars in uh, foreign exchange reserves and essentially no debt in regards to foreigners. Now, you compare those fundamentals to the Western bonds, and I don't see how you can even make a comparison. So, in my opinion, one of the greatest deals going forward is going to be grabbing some of these Chinese bonds. Again, that's only for investors who have risk money, and that's going to be money after everything else, including all the stacking. But uh, uh, this is the best bond play I can see out there right now, and we'll talk to you next time.